in East Africa is often not only fluent by people or willingness to be exploited, but trafficking in personal, not just in East Africa, as in Africa at large, is often fueled by people's willingness themselves to be exploited. And this is because of their desperate need for survival. And trafficking is usually revolving around two variables, the demand for cheap labor and, and exploitation, and at the same time, the willingness to meet the basic economic needs of the survivors of victim of human trafficking. So the problem of trafficking often do not begin with the traffickers, but with the circumstances that force the victim to seek better living condition in the environments that render them vulnerable and at the end of the day become exploited. So different and different population or I mean different ways which we know that where trafficking is taking place is a little bit different compared to here. It's not involving kidnapping or coercive in such a way that force have to be taking place. Most of the time, those people who are trafficked by themselves are willing to or are always agree to engage themselves. And this is due to their, to their economic circumstances. So, the inter internal trafficking usually take the form of recruitment and movement of people from the rural area to urban center for exploitative work such as prostitution, forced domestic workers, which actually take the large party of those who are migrated to town, pickpocket, waiter, and so forth. But it is also taking place on the formal kind of work like construction companies, factories, mining, and so forth. And the attraction to the tourism as the, you can see that the Tanzania and Kenya are on the side of the Indian Ocean. So it is attracting a lot of tourism who are coming to town of Zanzibar and Mombasa. And this cause women from other parts of the country to move into the coast region to work and then at the end of the day, they subject themselves to the sexual exploitation. But in Kenya, the demand of sexual industry is so huge to the point that it is even pulling women from other side of the parties of the country, like even nearby countries like Sudan, Uganda, Ethiopia, and even South Asia. So victims are usual traffic to Middle East, Europe, and North America for those domestic work, but also in South Africa, Mozambique, which is within the nearby countries within Africa itself. But most of them also goes to Asia country in Yemen, Oman, Pakistan, China, and so forth. So the cross-border trafficking always, the cross-border trafficking takes the form of recruitment and movement of people from one country to another for the purpose of exploitation. And the stability and infrastructure actually of these countries are the one which attracts more movement and migration of people. So people are trafficked for labor and for any other reason, especially most of them women and young girls for sexual exploitation and children from other countries like Rwanda, Burundi, and Uganda are also well known as adults from Bangladesh also are also coming in and even India and Nepal for that particular purpose of sex exploitation and sex trafficking. So most of the cross borders trafficking are facilitated by legal recruitment agencies who usually enter into the so-called transport for work agreements. That's when they pay for the transport of a victim, and then the victim has to enter into a contract to engage themselves to work for that particular uh, uh, for that particular trafficker within a certain period of time. So these agreements they actually hinder the victim and re they result to perpetrate the period of forced and also the bonded labor, labor to those particular victims. So 
this is just a map which showing the percentage of movement which are taking place. You can see the 99% of the victim are trafficked from down sub-Sahara here, but they're all moved to the Asia in the, and a few of them in East Europe and East Asia. And 11% of the victim are actually within Middle East and West and South Europe. Most of them is just 20% and some of them are going up to North America. So while there are some who do not consent to the traveling, but most of them who are involved in trafficking are fully informed, either are either, I mean, not consenting or are, are not fully informed about how the traveling will be. But most moved while they are aware and that they know what are they going to face, including violence, abuse, and exploitation. But they still agree on it and decide to take a risk. So why trafficking is so prevailing in this particular area is due to number one, poverty, as it was well elaborated yesterday with Charles, but lack of livelihood opportunities. Eh? Most of the villages, most of the victims are coming from a very remote areas where they are not that educated, illiterate is contributing, and they don't have any survival means. So they just decide to agree so that they can see if they can get any opportunity further. But we have also got the harmful culture practices. I think this is also happening a lot even in India. We also have it in Africa as some of the Indian and African cultures are almost resembling. So we have the culture problem, and this has actually been proved that in Africa, it is widely contributing to the fueling of trafficking. But also the family character, the background where these particular victims are coming from is contributing also to, to trafficking and illiteracy at large. So poverty is actually, as I've mentioned, reported to be the major cause of trafficking. And this is due to the destitution of the parents and they are optimistic to believe that once, you know, to be, and they're optimistic to believe that the promises that they made to the trafficker maybe will come true and get the opportunity moment. But also on the lack of livelihood opportunities, most of the time is the one which is pushing victim to agree to just engage themselves in trafficking. Although some of them are sometimes not aware or they're just believing whatever they are told, but most of the time, some of them are aware, but they're still just going to engage themselves. And parents and also relatives most of the time facilitated the trafficking of their children when their means of making a living fails. And in believing that this will maybe ensure that their children will get the needs or whatever which they require. So women and children have become more vulnerable also as they have most of the time fewer livelihood opportunity as they are less likely to have land and capital to run their life. And this is also affected due to the culture of subordination which we have in Africa and the inequality which is still existing among men and women. So it is also reflecting in the laws. You can find that we still have got some laws in Tanzania, even in Kenya and Rwanda, which are still existing, which does not allow female to own land apart from inherited land and so forth. So all of this make them to be more vulnerable to trafficking. And those who are also uneducated, those who are homeless, this actually goes to the personal status of those particular person. The most of it now when we come to the culture, as I've said that most of the cultures which are happening in Tanzania, they're a little bit resembled here. We have got the forced marriage and child marriage, which is well, do I, which is, I mean, have spread a lot and common there. We have got the female genital matriculation and the payment of jewelry process. 
but we also got the witchcraft accusation, which this must be a little bit new from, from here. I don't know if it is just that practicable in India, where elder women are accused of being witch whenever something bad is happening within the society. And this has caused them, you know, to be subjected to a lot of persecution. And for that purpose, then they usually have either to run away from their society or to live in a life of slave within their society. And if they happen to run away, then at the end of the day, they've been subjected to a lot of explo exploitation and so forth. So those are among the cultures also. We have a female genital matriculation, which actually is widespread over there. And most of the girls who are now aware are trying to run away from it and subject themselves into trafficking. But in, if they are not running away from it, they keep on staying in the society. They keep on acquiring a low status because once you in other societies which it is wide practice, a girl who is not circumcised does not have a value within the society. Even if you are married, they will realize that you are, you are not circumcised. What they will do, you will be segregated. You will be considered that you are not bringing lucky to that particular family. You won't be able to be involve yourself in other activities like, you know, cooking for the family members or even go to first water with other colleges. So they actually ended up live in a life of slave for those who are not agreeing into a culture. Apart from that, on the first marriage, the traditional of people doing arrangement of marriage is still there, married by abduction, where a guy who can just organize with his friends and go and abrupt, abrupt the admirer or whoever whom he wants to marry to the point that after abduction, he will take him to his house and then that girl will be raped. And then this will force the parents in that family to agree to the marriage proposal. So they do that in a, in a way of negotiating the marriage proposal. Because once a girl then is raped, is still a stigma. She, she will not be able to go back to her family anymore because of the stigma. And she will not even be able to be married to anyone else within the village. So at the end of the day, for those who are victim who manage to survive the, all the time, try to flew away out of the society, out of that community, so, and to start life somewhere else where again, they're going to be subjected to trafficking and all those kind of exploitation. So a uh, traditional and those kind of customer have been so rampant, like the FMG, I mean, the female genital mutilation, it's have been so popular. You can see that most of 29 countries in Africa is practicing it, and also Middle East and Egypt. And a lot of people, the highest total number of women, which is 27.2 million, who have been subjected to that particular procedure while they're attaining the percentage of 80% has occurred the highest percentage is 98, which has happened in Somalia. So on this particular culture, it has been so popular to the point that the European Council of Assembly have recognized FNG to be one of the basic of Aslam seeking. If one can run away for, of it, the survivor or victim who are running away of it, they can ask for an Aslam in any European country because it is recognized as one of the bases for seeking for Aslam. Um, so, oh, coming back here, I just want to, I just want to go back here and to show you this picture of this lady who was interviewed with this particular lady who was interviewed he just got married at the very very young age to this particular gentleman here because now they've been forced because of the culture of the payment of jewelry young girls are forced to be married to the people who are looking a little bit more worth within the society and this lady was actually trying to escape this particular marriage and she was at, she attempted to kill her child that's when she was rescued and the interview was done so this is the kind of 
things which are actually happening, how the girls are pushed and to go to rural, to, I mean, to go to town and be exploited there too. While on the other end, this young lady who was just married at the age of 12, and then she conceived and got pregnant for this particular, to, 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 to these two, to these two uh, twins. Now they are all suffering there. So on the other hand, then apart from the culture, the perpetuation or the perception that working in urban area is less laborious and pays more than working in the rural areas is also widespread. So people have been moving, knowing that in, you know, in urban area, in town city, will be able to do some job and it will not be so tiresome because most in African country, most of the people who are living in the village, they are depending on agriculture. And apart from that, the fact that there are fewer recreation and also social opportunities in villages move people also automatically to move in town. We have, I have this picture here, which is trying to summarize all of these pushing factors which are pushing people to be subjected to human trafficking and so forth. So also the tradition practices of poor or rural family sending their children to live with sites-based relatives or even unknown families for either education in exchange of household, household calls is taking place. And also having larger family has been a very major cause of it in Africa that families are becoming too large and people are not being able to take care with their families anymore. So they just have to send their kids and subject them, you know, to do some work so that they can earn money and be able to run the family. Apart from that, we have illiteracy, which also play a party or a big party in this, uh, in fueling human trafficking where that less educated people are more frequently exploited because they have no other ways of making a living or little understanding of how life it is conducted in urban where they migrate and then they end up to be subjected to human trafficking. Uh, the pull and factors which actually attracting or pushing people to engage themselves in trafficking crimes is cheap and low skill labor that everyone want to make more profit. So once they want to make more profit, they are attracted to cheap and, and low skilled labor and also state economy and the difference which is there on the states between those developed country and undeveloped country or even within Africa itself, because most of the Africans country, most people from African country also are moving like from Kenya to Uganda to South Africa, the country which is, you know, at least in a more way developed compared to other country. So the inequality, economic inequalities, which is there move people also to move, I mean, push people to move from one place to another. And weak border controls, which actually is created by the economic cooperation between East African and also South African countries. This economic, I mean, this cooperation have been facilitated as smooth moving between one in the, people from one particular country to another. And the effect of globalization and also conflicts which is taking place to the case which actually resulted to a lot of people to be moving from one country to another. But we also have the use of organ or the body party for ritual purpose is one of the things which also contribute to the, to the, to the pulling factor of human trafficking in Africa. So employers are usually attracted by cheap labor, which is more profitable than less or non-exploitative form of labor. And also militaries in countries like Kenya and Uganda and even Tanzania have been reported to use traffic person for combating duties and sexual servicing for soldiers and military purpose function. So and also they've been used to provide sexual services to the soldiers. So this is also one of the factor which is pulling. And also, 
And also they have been condemned for abduction of people from North Uganda and South Uganda and Sudanese and also Congolese citizens, particularly children. And victims of human trafficking are used also in ritual, as I've mentioned, practices where is involving witchcraft and also involving some other religious leaders. If you have heard a lot, it was widespread, especially this was done for those people who are living with albinism and it was it was it was widespread they were hunted they were killed just to get their organ as it was widespread believing that their organ once they're mixed with a certain traditional medication they can bring charm to the business or they can make a business make more profit and so forth so this hunting of organ has actually caused abduction of people and people have been moved from one particular to another and so forth. So oh, that is the kind of pattern which is taking place in Africa. All of these countries under study have been ratify and signing international human rights instruments, which is or are directly dealing with trafficking. All the convention, the Paremo protocol, and as other human rights instruments, the convention on the right of the child, the African charter on the rights and welfare of the child also, which this is among the charter, which is within Africa at the regional level. And also apart from the regional level, all the Charters which regarding women's rights and all the charters containing children's rights are providing for the provision of protection and prevention of human trafficking. But East Africa also have got regional efforts which they've done under East Africa community. They've developed a bill of East Africa anti-trafficking bill. Uh, although the bill is not effective yet until today, since 2016, but at least there are some agreeing effort which was done within the subregion to make sure that they are doing or they are curbing human trafficking. So all of these instruments listed here, the labor, I mean the first labor one, which deal with human trafficking have been ratified and they have been agreed to be applicable with this particular country, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. Apart from that, and at the domestic level, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda also, all of them have got anti-trafficking acts. They've got legislation, although their legislation are differ and some of the penalties which are there for human trafficking are a little, little bit differ. For instance, in Kenya, the Anti-Trafficking Act, the TPA, is providing the minimum of 30 years imprisonment or a fine of $280 for $1,000 for a crime of trafficking. But when you come to Tanzania, we have got only a Anti-Trafficking Act is only providing from one year up to 20 years imprisonment with only fine of 2,000 up to 65,000 US dollars fine in case. But also when we come to Uganda, we have a one year up to 20 years of imprisonment, but Uganda has a life imprisonment for those kind of trafficking which we are involved with children. So at least this one is a little bit harder compared to the rest. But other countries like Kenya, they've got a special act which is protecting victim, the Victim Protection Act, which actually specifically provide measure and other legal procedures to make sure that victim are protected. Apart from that, on from the legislation also, Kenya has got the National Action Plan, which is actually dealing with all kind of action, including the awareness, the protection of victim. And also Tanzania has the Anti-Human Trafficking Act, 
I mean, at anti-human trafficking units, which is specifically or oh, have been established to deal with human trafficking issues. And Uganda is it's have got a coordination office, which is called Coordination Office for the Prevention of Trafficking. And apart from that, these governments, according because of the its economic position, it is depending much on non-government organization, which are working within their country to especially on the prevention of human trafficking and this is due to their economic position so although the law is there although the structure is there and the and the and the plan is there most of the time this plan have turned up not to be very effective because the government have not actually um delicate fund to 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 put up all the structures which is needed for instance in kenya they've got the victim protection act which is actually providing all the procedures and all the things which the victim of human trafficking are supposed to to acquire but at the end of the day most of the time victim will end up not to have any remedy because of not to have fund. So non-government of an organization have been played the major rules in the country especially on the protection of victim to provide shelter for the victim even to identify victims something which actually have been a major problem in this country victim of human trafficking are still taken as the offenders instead of victim so although the law are there everything is said the international human rights have been have been implemented have been ratified but the problem it has been coming into the implementation the human trafficking is still wide and it is because to, of the level of the evidence also which is needed the level of evidence which is required for one to prove is so high to the point that most of the time victims who are not well protected most of the time are not willing to engage themselves or to 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 provide evidence in the court of law but another problem is also most of these laws as you can see that they provide alternative of fine in lieu of imprisonment so although the years or oh, the the, the 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 imprisonment years are high but it is either you pay a fine or you also go to save those years if you don't have fine and most of the i mean most of the accused or most of the perpetrator of human trafficking are those people with wealth they are doing it in terms of business so you may find most of the time for those very few prosecution which is they are successful taking place they end up paying the money or paying the fine which is required by law and get away of it so that actual has been a major problem especially on the prosecution of of this of this trafficking offenses but now another one is the corruption which is widespread and this is not just to the traffickers but also it, the officers who are supposed to implement this law have sometimes been accused of receiving bribe from the traffickers and some of them in countries like uganda have been said to be involved or to have this kind of illegal recruiting agencies which are involving in human trafficking there was a case in 2015 where one of the of the diplomats from uganda was quoted for participating in human trafficking in america and he was deported as he could have not been sued due to the immunity of diplomatic which he has in uganda so he was deported and until today that particular diplomat was not prosecuted or no measure have been taken to prosecute that particular person so although the law has been there but for a very little it have contributed to curb human trafficking in this country but countries have been taken other major for recent tanzania through the ministry itself have tried to suspend the registration of all labor recruitment agencies so that they can vet them and see if those who are doing legal movements 
or legal recruitment and those who are doing in legal. And also the government has suspended the traveling documents for those people who are departing in Tanzania to go and work in other areas abroad. And the government has also required the employers abroad to deposit some form of security at the Tanzania embassy in their countries to ensure that at least they will be able to present with the migrant worker or they will be able to provide the proper uh, contract of employment to those migrant workers. And this has happened due to the crisis where a lot of workers where a lot of, I mean, migrants from Tanzania, a lot of workers who are going to work in Asia countries, especially in Egypt, South Sudan, in Kuwait, were involved in a lot of exploitation. Uh, so those are some of the challenges which are taking place there. But the number one challenge, as I've been talking about it, and it is well known, and this is the challenge, not just in Africa, but in so many times to curb human trafficking, is the poverty. As for many African migrants to migrate to other continents is an exceeding positive economy and development proposition for themselves and also their families. And through these remittances paid later in their communities and also their nation. The risk and abuse of the journey are seen as the price to be paid for the generation to return. So they are able to sacrifice everything in order to move to another country where they will see that they, they will be more prosper. So property is the major challenge and also in effective enforcement of the law. As I've said, the law is there, but it is not that effective due to those different reasons, but the major one is the evidence and the protection of victim. If victim are not protected, then are not capable of being able to provide evidence. And if they're not capable of being able to provide evidence, the whole purpose of the law is meaningless. Also the institutional corruption, as I was explaining that it is happening and it is involved with the officials and also the fraudulent labor recruitment, which is taking place. So the study has just also recommend some measures to be taken, which are almost together with the, with the challenges which are there. Number one is to deal or to address with the root cause, which is unemployment and poverty. If the economy of the country will not improve, then and the poverty will continue, we should expect this to continue and it will not just end up there. So in Africa, curbing human trafficking, although we have the law, although we have the structure, although we have the plan, without curbing this particular root cause of human trafficking, which is unemployment and poverty, it will be very hard for it to be dealt with. There have been some trials which have been done. For instance, the country like Kenya have been facilitating and provide some grants to some youth to make sure that at least they can be able to employ themselves and generating their life. But also all of this country have been implemented and adapted the United Nations Millennium Development Goals which is coordinated internationally. And apart from that, they've also adapted the Sustainable Development Goals and they are working on it. But today, although all of this plan were there, like the Sustainable Development Goals, it have been there and all the plan and policy have been put down. But until now, uh, it, since 2015 until today, the poverty and reduction have been to the very low percentage. And this is because African states often suffer from limited institutional capacity to carry out policies that deliver benefits and service to citizens. In other words, they were very limited in capacitation. So apart from that, the study also has proposed that to enhance international and internal cooperation. We have got the East Africa community, but we have got the AU community. So all the country, we need to take advantage of the technology to make sure that at least 
it can be coordinated, they can be communicated, the use of data and so forth to be able to trace trafficking and also to ensure proper enforcement of law. And this should start from the victims themselves. If victim will be able to have a safe a condition or to have a, a safe place to run to, then at least prosecution could have been taken place. Kenya, under the Victim Act, they've actually put a requirement that a victim is allowed to be to be presented by a lawyer because before a lawyer was not supposed to go before the court of law and be able to stand or to run a case on behalf of the prosecution because most of the time all the cases criminal cases are run by the prosecution but now they've allowed that in case a victim of human trafficking wants to have a personal lawyer you can have a personal lawyer who at least can contribute and accompany the prosecutor who most of the time are working for the for the public to be able to make sure that they can facilitate, they can make sure they can deal with all the evidence so that the victim at the end of the day can get a justice and the traffic can be prosecuted. So anti-trafficking legislation also should amend, amend the law which actually providing fine in lieu of imprisonment to make sure that it is becoming more strict and also law enforcement officials need to be able to recognize trafficking this has been a major problem because until now as i've said and this major problem is coming from the cultural perspective until now trafficking is taken as a way of life in africa as I've said, everyone is trying hard to move from one place to another to make sure that he can sustain his life. This is happening even to the law enforcers. Law enforcers have not been seeing trafficking. Police are not taking it as an offense. They just take it as a means of people to survive. So you may find that it has been so hard to be identified as an offense. Things are taking place every day. Children are being abused, children are being exploited in town, but it has been a way of life. Parents, they don't see it as if it's a problem, is exploitation. Even the law enforcers now, it has been so hard. They've been prosecuting cases, for instance, forced marriage, what is happening in abrasion of marriage. Most of the time, if parents are capable, what is read is the case of rape. So instead of prosecuting trafficking offenses, they just prosecute other offenses which are nearby related to what is happening as trafficking. So additional training is needed to be provided at all levels of the government, particularly to enable them to identify and respond to human trafficking issue. And also the remuneration of the officials need to be to be improved in, in case we want to make a progress so that they cannot be involved into the corruption or even engage themselves now into be human traffickers. Also to improve victim protection, as I've already said that, although the law says that victim need to be provided with the protection and so forth, but most of the time these people who are exploited and who have got no means, and if there is not even a shelter where they can run to, it's so hard for them to be able to stand up and prosecute these cases or co cooperate with the government to identify the trafficker. And the last one is the sensitization, as I've said that, and this is coming from the perspective and the culture and the structure or of the country itself. So a lot of sensitization is needed there so that even the society can be able to determine that what is happening is trafficking and is not the way of life. So the way forward is that anti-trafficking program should focus on offering a long-term sustainable alternative for eco perspective for economic and also social advantage to curb trafficking in, in Africa. And this is because what is defined as human trafficking is considered as a quest for new opportunities 
and a better life for many in Africa. And the vocal international campaign are perceived as an effort to restrict those who are looking for the better opportunities of their life. So to this end, let me just say this is the end of presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nora. It is a very wonderful presentation. You have clearly explained the problem of human trafficking in Eastern Africa, basically in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, in three countries. So I'm sure our participants have enjoyed your, enjoyed your lecture. So just to a little bit summarize your lecture, that you have clearly addressed the various issues of human trafficking. Uh, you talked about the, the form of trafficking happening in, in these three countries. You also explained the, you know, the various causes of human trafficking also spoke on the demand side. So th this is very interesting that you spoke about the demand side no? So that, that is the, you explained about the pool factors. And the very interesting thing that which is, you know, you related with the little bit, the fact with the India that that is the cultural practices now which, um, you know, grooming uh, around the human trafficking No. You explain about the female genital mutilation and the other aspect of the ritual practices going on in Africa. The similar kind of things also happening in India. So a little bit I'm going to speak that is in the last day about the you know the rituals and the cultural practices what happening in India. Also, this very interesting thing that you have explained the, the various effort is uh, you know taking care by the NGOs uh, to combat the human trafficking. And uh, in the you know, at the end, you also um, the interesting thing that you know uh, explain the legal aspects on protection of victims. So you know you have given a very clear pictures of human trafficking. You know starting from the you know the causes, why it is happening, how to protect the you know the uh, to the victims, and the, the you know the all this uh, international and the domestic legislation. Uh, uh, available in in these three countries. I'm sure I'm 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 I'm, I'm sure our participants uh, have enjoyed your lecture. And I have seen from this chat box that you know many participants they have raised many you know queries, and you know they have some few questions also there. So now I would like to invite our colleague Dr. Suresh Murmu who is going to the, uh, the session. So he will you know, take some questions and he will pass to you so that you can answer to the, uh, if you, you know, that queries or the questions. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you, Nora. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Yes. Yes. it's up to you. Yes. Thank you, sir. Dr. Mono, it is up to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nora Hashim, for your very wonderful presentation on uh, the efforts to address human trafficking in Eastern Africa. In your presentation, you have uh, very rightly discussed about the trends, patterns of human trafficking in Eastern Africa. And also you talked about different types of human trafficking, different causes responsible for the human trafficking and the factors which are very, very important. That is culture, economy, education and territorial issues, uh, which uh, play a very important role for uh, the human trafficking. So we have a uh, uh, few questions, uh, so maybe four or five questions I'll be uh, asking. And uh, the first question is from the Lewis Olatunzi. And uh, the question is, to what extent are victims of human trafficking aware of the level of exploitations they are going to be subjected to? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As I've already mentioned, some of the victims are aware exactly what they are going to face, but still 
due to the circumstances which they are living in, they opt to go through that suffering so that at the end of the day, they can be able in future to rescue their generation. That's why I've said that this is more of, it is paying off to their generation back. But most of them are not aware. And this is because those, I mean, illegal labor recruitment agencies, what they do is to deceive them. They allow them to enter through into the contract while they know that some of them are not quite aware and some of the things which they are promising within the contract are not right. So few of them knows through the stories and some of them who are lucky to hear about what is happening, they hear about it, but they still go. As I've said, there is a lot of women from East African countries which are going to Asia and to Saudi Arabia where they are ill mistreated. And nowadays in the world of technology, they are the things which most of the people, they hear about it. But at the end of the day, you still, you find more people are still deceived and migrated to there. So to some extent, I can say some of the victims knows exactly that there is a possibility that they are going to be exploited and they choose just to take a risk because of the circumstances, think that maybe it will pay off after them being labored for a certain particular quiet of time, then they'll be able to come back with at least a better life compared to where they were before but most of them are not aware and most of them they're aware but they don't still take it as if it's exploitation as you can happen for all of those cultural practices which are taking place it is happening the parents are aware that they're sending their children so that they can be able you know to they can be able to end something and support their families but still they are sending them so that's why i'm saying that some of the victim might be aware, and but most of them are not aware either. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam. Sorry, Suraj. Uh, sorry, Suraj. Um, sorry, Suraj. Before you continue, um, this is Louis here. I would like to um, also make one of two comments okay, on Dr. Nora's okay, uh, presentation. Um, uh, my question basically is born out of the fact that. Um, in human trafficking, when we prosecute cases of human trafficking, uh, we do not consider the fact that uh, someone is aware or not, because we there is a there is a, a sense that we must also uh, differentiate between sex work mm. and human trafficking. Mm. Because, for example, if someone wants, um, if someone is engaging in sex work, mm. he has the liberty to. It's just like you as a professor they have chosen to do sex work as a job but the fact that someone is even into sex work does not even prelude that individual from being exploited mm -hmm. and for example a sex worker can be raped a sex worker can be abused a sex worker can be trafficked because this is against her own wish most of the time the people we say that are aware of what they were going to do that are aware that, for example, a lot of them are aware of the fact that the job might be difficult, but they are not mm -hmm. aware that they are going to be exploited to that magnitude. Mm -hmm. So when we prosecute cases of human trafficking, and according to the extant law, either mm -hmm. they are aware or not, does not preclude an individual from being prosecuted. That is one. Two, an underage person does not have a consent Mm -hmm. If someone is below the age of 18, the individual under the extant law does not have a consent. So you cannot consider um, the consent of um, someone who is under the age of 18 as his mm -hmm. own consent, as if he's aware of what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. So that is another thing. So it's important for us to uh, identify this uh, when we um, uh, look at the, uh, when we're considering the issues of human trafficking. And um, uh, most of the time, the ex, for example, if the parents are aware that a child is going to be exploited, for example, when we give out a child in child marriage, it is not the child who is giving out mm. herself to child marriage, it's the parent. Mm -hmm. So in this 
situation, the parent are the one who are facilitating that mm. act of exploitation to the child. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nora. It's, this is very exciting. Thank you, Louis. And, thank um, you. And I hope that we will continue. We will be able to do more, much more um, sensitization together in, in times ahead. Sure. Thank, thank you, you Dr. Suresh. Uh, Dr. Nora, would you like to respond to the added points of Louis? Pardon? Uh, would you like to respond to the added points made by the Louis? Which point can you please make it again? Sorry. Uh, I mean, I think uh, Louise was Louise? just clarifying about the point of being aware, is it? Okay, okay. No, then it's okay. Then we'll move to the next question. The question uh, asked by three participants. So I have combined those questions because those were similar. The question okay. is how how the rescued victims of human trafficking are sent back to the mainstream society. And what are the major challenges in this? So the major challenge which we have there, number one, is to identify the victim themselves. Because most of the time, as I've said, that although the law are there, they've been misleaded. Most of the time, instead of being taken as a victim, they've been taken as, as offenders. For example, for those who are moving outside, are coming from outside the countries, once they get the opportune moment of running back to the countries, what they do is they face with the persecution and prosecution of why did you went away without the proper procedure. So they most of them they've been actually accused instead or prosecuted for immigration procedures but for those victims who are rescued this has been done a lot with the NGO they actually been put in self houses which are actually very few and are not capable of coming curbing all of them but most of the non-governmental organization have established few self houses where victims are usually kept there and are going through the counseling and all the healthy 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 services they need while at the same times now the, the 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 legal procedure is taking place for instance other countries what they are doing nowadays they have got a certain specific desk where and opportunity where the police officers are visiting those houses to check and to see what the claim do the victim have and facilitating the prosecution of their cases so through those procedures or through those houses, the victim are getting trained after getting the psychological help they required and are empowered now to be able to get back to the society and start again to live their life, including even economic empower, because most of the non-governmental organization, they provide fund and they provide also some training to make sure once victims are getting out of those house are at least able of moving on with their life. Thank you so much. The next question is by Dr. Devendra Biswal from the Central University of Ranchi. The question is that is related to, as you spoke in your presentation, that uh, the cultural practices are also very, very important factors. So that is related to that uh, you know, aspect. The question is, what are the issues of customary laws and human rights laws in South Africa? Come again, what are there? Issues of customary laws issues. and human rights, yeah, human rights law in South Africa. So customer law have been a challenge in many African countries, not just South Africa. There are some of the country in Africa they have now stipulated in their legislation that whenever the common law is in contradiction with the customer law, customer law should prevail. But in other constitution, and which we most of the time term it to be the women favored constitution, like the constitution of Rwanda, the constitution of Lesotho, they've specifically provided that any customer law 
which is against the right of women cannot prevail at, at, at any circumstances. But customer law in other countries, like for example, which I was saying in Tanzania, until today's, it's still prevailing. Whenever there is any issue among which is involving customs and the common law, then the customs is, take, is prevailing. For the case of South Africa, it is recognized that the customer law is one among the law which goes together with the common law. And in South Africa, although, I mean, human rights and women rights have been, have been have been implemented a lot, but still those customs are there and they're practicing. All of those type of customary law, which are harmful to women, which I've said they're happening in East Africa, they're also happening in South Africa. Although the law is there, but its enforcement have been very few. Nowadays, most of the, most of the judges have been very good to quash this particular law. For instance, we have a recent case which was happening this March in Tanzania, where the High Court, the Supreme Court of Tanzania, declare the family law of Tanzania, which allow a girl of 13 years old and a boy of 15 years old to get married and under the customary law. So this particular law was actually quashed and the court has ordered the government to change this particular law to, 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 to cooperate or to reflect the international instruments because all of the international instruments which provide the age of 18 to be the age of marriage have been ratified by Tanzania. But still the domestic law is saying otherwise. So for that purpose, nowadays at least judges have been taking charge while they are deciding any law which involving the rights of the girls or women rights or the culture which are considered to be harmful. They make sure that they are also translating it and interpreting it in the line of international human rights. Uh, so to some extent now, those human rights have been realized uh, whenever there is a contradiction between culture and human rights, sometimes the judges are deciding according to the human rights. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now the last question is again the combination of you know two questions asked by the participants and uh, by Dr. Rusikas Meher and uh, A. Chataji. The question is, how is victimhood in human trafficking perceived in wider society in these African nations? At the beginning, at the beginning, those who, who are recruiting them, they have a system of capturing a picture that those victims are living good life in case they're migrating out of there. Of the, of the country or in case they're migrating to town. So the picture which the society have sometimes is like there is a better life, although you'll be migrated, but very few of them now they've come to realize, and this is coming again in the world of technology where people hear what is happening, where people hear how are they exploited. At least now they've turned up to be aware, but the stigma is still there. The kind of exploitation a person has been subjected to in other way around brings stigma to the society, especially those who are involved in sexual exploitation and so forth. But for the forced labor, some of them have been taken in a, even in a positive way. And this is happening according to those people who are organizing it. Those who are recruiting people illegally have been put in such a way that it is a green pasture. So the victim at the end of the day have been looked as if it's not something threatening. That's why they keep on recruiting more and more victims to involved into human trafficking. But the society at large, for those who are involved in sexual exploitation, they are taking into a very negative way and the stigma is still there. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for responding all the questions very systematically. Now, over to Professor Acharya for concluding remarks. Professor Acharya. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. 
thank you dr suresh and thank you very much uh, dr nora for this nice presentation and i'm sure our all participants they have enjoyed your lecture and uh, i just uh, i would like to announce two things that um, all the lectures we are uploading in the youtube the university is uploading in youtube so just uh, go to the youtube and put the uh, title of the the conference and you can uh, you can see the lecture in youtube the second thing is uh, tomorrow is the day 5 of this international webinar and um, we have uh, invitees from mexico this is dr armando and he is going to speak on representation of human trafficking in Mexican mass media and its complexity on law enforcement. So um, I thank all our participants and our resource person for being with us. And uh, really, really, Nora, it is a very wonderful lecture. And uh, our, I'm sure our participants have enjoyed. So see you tomorrow. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, Nora, can you hear me?